cool. For those of you who are new to Mint Method, just want to walk through some basic principles, how um, this approach is very different from the standard way people think about learning a language. The fundamental purpose of language is connection. There's other things like, you know, reading and all that kind of stuff. Really, the reason why human beings are doing what I'm doing right now is so we can connect with each other on a deeper level and communicate, understand the hearts, minds of other people. Um, the fundamental experience of engaging language, understanding someone and expressing yourself is flow, right? Flow is an actual state of mind that we enter into when we're engaging people. So this is what we're going after is what we focus on in our programs. Um, let me miss somebody real quick. And then finally, the fundamental reality of language is movement. I used to say language is about sound. It is, but more fundamentally, it's about movement. Everything I'm doing right now is just the product of me moving a bunch of things in my face and in my lungs and in my, in my body, right? So we wanna understand things on the movement physiological um, level. And basically just to kind of review that, the, um, one way you can summarize all this is that, you know, you're learning French, you're learning German, your goal is to connect with French speakers by entering into flow state in conversation. Um, and the way you're gonna do that is you're gonna learn how to move like them. Learn how to move your face and your mouth like them, how to move your body like them. When you move and sync with somebody, that's the way you can enter flow and be connected. All right. Uh, cool. So the movement we're going to be focusing on, or the movements rather, we're going to be focusing on are these R movements, these R sounds. And what makes these sounds special? Whether you're learning French or Spanish or German, it always tends to be the R that gives people the most, you know, headache. And it's a couple of reasons for this. I'll quickly review. One is that they're one of the most common sounds in any language. And that means something because there's only so many sounds at first off. And if I'm saying something, um, let's say in French, if I say like, um, je vais rentrer aujourd'hui, right? In that second, that was like a second of speech, I made the R sound three times, right? So that's three times in a second, which means if I'm not able to pronounce it properly, um, so I'm distorting it with an accent, or if it gets stuck in my mouth, that's three times in a second, I'm already getting stuck, right? Um, and that's just one second, I gotta keep going. So these things kind of pile up on top of each other, making it very difficult to enter into that flow if you have it distorted or disrupted on a, on a consistent basis. The other thing, this letter R, the script R, um, we use to represent a variety of different movements, right? So the English R, is different from the French R. In French, there's actually three different sounds you'll make with the R and it kind of overlaps differently with the Portuguese. Within Brazil, they did the R differently. So there's lots of mental confusion. When I hear people making pronunciation errors around the R, some of it is because they're not able to do the movement. Some of it is they can do the movement, but they're confusing the sound due to the fact that it's written um, with a single letter, right? That's not helping anything. Um, and then finally, you know, you might say, oh, why are they, why do these sounds, if they're so different, if the movements are so different, why are they captured with the same letter? And part of the reason for that is because the R sounds typically play a similar function across language. They kind of group together with, with consonants. They kind of sneak in in between syllables. So the way they show up in one language to the next um, is similar across all languages. And what that means is that because your brain and your motor system is working in patterns, your brain might recognize like, oh, I didn't really hear something there. That must be that R sound I know from my language, right? And then more confusion occurs. So all this together just means that this R sound is very easy to mess up, very easy to confuse, and it happens all the time, right? So fixing this sound and getting the pronunciation right or even better in some meaningful way uh, is no small thing. It bubbles up all the way to the top, right? So. What we're doing in our mastery of any movement is focusing on these five different dimensions. First is accuracy, all right? You wanna make a h sound. If you're saying r, it's inaccurate. You're not doing the right sound. You're not matching the native speakers. Next, variety. These sounds occur in several different combinations with other sounds. So just because you can do the, the R sound here doesn't necessarily mean you can do the R sound in combination with a T sound or in combination with an F sound, right? Just show of hands real quick. How many people are able to do the R sound in French or German or whatever, 
decently enough in some situations, but not all situations. Some, right? Some combos kind of trip you up. That's a variety issue. Um, or maybe how many of you can do it sometimes, but not all the times. Like you catch it, but sometimes you just kind of like, you know, hawk a loogie or whatever, right? That's a consistency issue. So what we're looking for is being able to be accurate in all the variety of situations that are relevant to you in that language um, on a consistent basis, just hitting, hitting all the free throws, you know, nonstop, right? Then there's a question of speed. You know, you can do this in a slow speech, but our ultimate goal is to flow at the same speed as the native speakers. Um, and when we increase speed, that tends to lead to a reduction in accuracy and consistency. So we wanna gradually build up to a higher speed while maintaining that accuracy and consistency. And then the final piece here is efficiency. And to produce a movement requires energy, right? And the main energy we're dealing with here when we're speaking is our, is our air, our breath. So especially for this R sound, you know, who has this experience? You know, you, maybe you can do it, but you get to that R sound in French and you're like, uh, way mon frère, right? And then like all the air of the sentence just gets gassed out. You have to like, you know, put your hands on your knees and breathe for like 10 seconds to like come and finish the sentence, right? So that's an efficiency issue. You might be able to get the sound, you know, accurately enough, but ideally you want to be more and more graceful and make more and more effortless. And it just kind of glides out just like any other sound and you can keep on flowing, all right? Cool. Um, one last slide and I'll get the questions and we'll move on to exercises. So as you guys know, who, who work with me, I go really deep into the detail and I'm going really nitty gritty and we'll be doing that in these workshops. And a lot of times people might think, oh, why, why are we getting so in this, spending so much time on such a small detail? Um, ultimately, I want to be able to speak the language and just one sound can't make that much of a difference, right? Wrong. Everything's connected. Small things have massive consequences. So Think about what your R is right now. If you can get to a high level of accuracy and all the variety, be consistent with it, be fast, be graceful and effortless, then that'll lead to you speaking with less stuttering and stopping and more flow and grace, right? Remember that example I gave, that was three R's in one sentence or one second. So if you can make that a clean R, then you can just keep flowing and not be th 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 stumbling all the time. Um, that's disruption, your flow. Distortion has to do with your accent. So maybe it's not messing up your flow, but it sounds very, you know, American or British or whatever, you know, Spanish or whatever your background might be, you know. So what was the sentence I said earlier in French? Je vais rentrer aujourd'hui, right? If I say with my American accent, say je vais rentrer aujourd'hui, right? And that, once again, that's one second. Second, I gave myself away three times as being American, <laughs> right? So you know, I want to sound less like a foreigner and more like a native, for several reasons not least of which because it makes me more attractive to the natives. I don't mean um, in a romantic sense, though that could be relevant. It's more that when people are speaking to people, um, if they sound like you, it's just more easy for the person who's speaking with you, right? Um, especially in French. If you go to France, a lot of people are kind of bougie about their, their language. And, you know, if, you're, if you are messing up their R sounds, not everyone, but you know, a significant number of people will have a negative reaction to that. That negative reaction will have a negative reaction on you um, by affecting your confidence and the and you're speaking. That goes back into making you stutter and stop even more. So all these things are connected in this crazy feedback loop. Um, so once again, mastering your R can lead to a massive up uptick in your confidence, um, which goes downstream to everything else. When you're more confident, you speak more, you speak more, you learn faster, you retain more, and you have more fun while you're doing it. And then fundamentally, what's our purpose of language? to be connected to people, right? So one little sound, right? One R sound, if you take the time to really get it right, can have a massive impact upstream on everything else in your language um, goals and journey, okay? The first thing we're gonna do, the exercise, is to gain an awareness, a, a physical, mental awareness of our mouth and what's actually at play here when we're speaking this sound. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Uh, okay, cool. You guys see my screen again? All right. So this is a side view of the mouth. You see my lips here, my nose. Um, and this right here is my tongue. Now, this is all well and good to look at. I want you guys to actually feel this inside of your, inside of your head, inside of your body. So we're going to do a kind of a, a type of mindfulness activity. Uh, so follow along with me back home. 
I want you to uh, make the D sound. Duh, duh, duh. Okay, with the D sound, what we are doing is taking the tip of our tongue, which is point number one on this graph, and putting it to the gum line just above our teeth, known as the alveolar ridge. Uh, sneak peek, this is where we make our Spanish sounds. But for now, duh, duh, duh is fine. Okay, next, I want you to say the, the J from John. Say J, J, J. J, J, J. Here we're using a middle part of our tongue up here to the post alveolar ridge blending into the hard palate, All right? J, 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 J. Next, I want you to say the G sound, G, 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 G. Okay, this is made using the, the back part of our point number five and moving it up to the soft palate, okay? So we have uh, three different, oh, sorry. We have three different um, movements producing three different sounds. All right, now what we're gonna do once again is uh, first put some visuals on it. All right, so I want everyone to look at my camera in the corner here and see if you can find my camera and look at my tongue when I make the D. When I make the J. And when I make the G. Great, now I want everyone to go into their own cameras, right? Um, so you can find your own face on the thing. And anyone, once again, embarrass ourselves together. I want you to kind of work your way through those sounds to see if you can see your tongue doing what we saw on the screen. D first. Da, 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 da. Then the J. Ja, 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 ja. Then the G in the back. See if you can get a good view, some, some good light in your throat. Ga, 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 ga. All right, great. So now you've seen it for yourself. It happens in your own mouth as well. And um, now we have visuals on it, but what really matters is the motor sensory, the, the feeling of moving your muscles and the feeling of your tongue coming into contact with the roof of your mouth, right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take just a couple of seconds to map out that experiential landscape. If you think about it, touch has a feeling, right? It has a feeling to it. And you probably don't think consciously about the touch inside of your own mouth. So we're gonna bring all your attention to that space and kind of map it there. And I'm kind of, kind of, kind of like a meditation guide you through it. So I want you to close your eyes um, and then place your tongue into the D position but don't make the sound, just leave your tongue there. All right, leave it there, press your tongue against the, the gum line. All right, close your eyes. And then I want you to first bring your attention to the feeling of pressure on your gum line and see if you can separate that from the feeling on your tongue. If you pay attention, there's two separate feelings, but it might take some time for you to separate them in your mind. And you can move your tip of your tongue around a little bit to play with the feeling. Once again, your goal here is to separate those two sensations. All right, now I want you to apply more pressure and then release the pressure up and keep doing that. And while you're doing that, see if you can notice or find where in your tongue the muscles are being activated to create that pressure. All right, you might notice it deeper in your tongue, tension 
as you press harder and then release it. All right, good. Now we're gonna move to the J. Same thing, place your J position. Don't make the sound, just place that part of your tongue to it as if you're going to make it. And then see if you can distinguish between the feeling in the roof of your mouth and the feeling in the middle of your tongue. Notice how there's more surface area of your tongue at play here compared to before of the tip. You have the left side of your tongue and the right side. See if you can separate those two different feelings of sensation, one from the roof of the mouth, one from the tongue. Now apply pressure again. See if you can notice the muscles. Okay, great. Now finally moving on to the G. Say G, 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 and then place your tongue in the G, but don't release it. Same thing. Try to separate the feeling of the back of your tongue from the back of your, of your mouth, right from the roof of your mouth. Try to move, slide that back of your tongue up and down against that surface. Slide it up and see if you can notice the feeling going up. Slide it down, see if you can notice the feeling going down. And then finally apply pressure and see if you can notice the muscles. Cool, all right. That's good for now. Hope you enjoyed your first meditation with Yudelsa. Uh, great. Does anyone want to share anything they interesting they've noticed while doing that? Maybe something surprised you. You didn't know you discovered about your own tongue before. I just didn't realize how much of the tongue is used when we say the J sound. Mm, nice. Yeah, you notice there's more tongue. There's more surface area compared to the tip for the D's. Right. Good. Good observation. Anything else? Any other just observations, noticings. I never realized I had all those feelings. Yep. You exactly. know, could, my tongue, yes, but not my palate. Yep. But somehow I feel that I'm not using um, like all the length of my tongue. Like I feel I'm using like, um, or I feel like my tongue is too long, like, a, like compared to the picture. Like I feel I'm using like, not a tip, but maybe half of it. Like uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> for what specific sound were you feeling that for? Mm, can I say that again? What specific sound? Which one were you feeling that for? Uh, for the G. The G. So you're feeling what exactly? Um, like, because I thought you were supposed to feel like the back or like the further part of your tongue. But I feel mm. this... Um, that is still like the middle, like uh, that you still have, like yeah, like one part that goes like I guess really to the to your throat. The, the... yeah, yeah, it's good, great, so cool. So what happened there is, um, and that's a good segue back to the chart. You guys see my screen again? Cool. So why do we do this, right? You can look at a chart all day, but it doesn't really mean anything until you you actually map it back into your personal experience. Um, so as the last speaker was saying that um, she saw this chart and said, okay, cool, point number five. And she had the expectation of feeling it at a certain place. And then when she made the G sound, um, she was like, well, surely this is way, she was maybe thinking it was, she was using this part of the tongue, right? So if I try to instruct somebody on how to use their tongue without any without that person having done enough initial work to actually orient their tongue in their, their mouth. If I say, move this part of your tongue, they'll move this part, right? Or I say, this is point number five, they'll think it's point number three. So the expectation is if you're your first time doing this, 
all of this will be dark. All of this will be confused because you like, um, like Karen said earlier, you know, you don't think about this stuff. So you don't realize it. You don't, you speak all day without actually consciously thinking about the feelings and the movements in the process. Uh, so it's good. It's good to be surprised by those things. Um, each time you do this, and I highly recommend kind of doing this on your own time, just kind of feeling around that space and seeing if you can map it to a visual like this. Each time you do this, you're shining a light on that part of your mouth so that when you're learning a new movement, it's much simpler. And by way of comparison, if you're trying to learn the piano with me, you'd sit down next to me and you'd look at my fingers and then you would try to mimic the movement of my fingers with your own hands, right? Uh, if we're learning how to dance, you look at my feet and then you'd mimic how my feet are moving with your own feet, right? But if I'm speaking a language, you're not gonna be able to see most of the things, right? And if you can't hear it properly, then what do you have to work with? So that's the issue. We can't mimic these movements unless we have some way of recognizing how they're mapped. Um, in order to do that, you need to be able to see, you know, in your inner eye and what's going on in your mouth, all right? Great, so now that we have our basic kind of mapping here, that's the tip of our tongue, the body of our tongue, and the back of our tongue. Now we're gonna move into the French, um, R, sorry, the R sounds of interest here, all right? Um, so we're gonna come back to this page, but these are the four sounds that we're going to cover here. Uh, quick review for those of you who've done my project before. What's the difference between a consonant and a vowel? A vowel is when sound can just, uh, when air can flow out of your mouth unobstructed. I, o, we, o, these are all vowel sounds, right? The moment that I block the airflow or restrict it in some kind of way, uh, I now have a consonant sound, okay? So when you distinguish one consonant from the next, what we're looking at is three things. The first is, are my vocal cords vibrating? Vocal cords are here. During that blockage, yes or no? So I can say, which is voiceless, or I can turn my voice on, and I'm voiced, right? Next question I'm asking is, where in my speech organ, my speech instrument, is this blockage occurring, right? Is it occurring with, you know, this part of my tongue up to the soft palate, this part of my tongue up to the alveolar ridge, et cetera, et cetera. Where, what's the place of articulation? Finally, um, the, the final question is, what type of blockage is it? And there's different names for it. Uh, the only ones you need to know for our purposes today are fricative and approximate. Fricative means that um, the, two, the, the two articulators, in this case, the tongue and the roof of the mouth, come into physical contact but there's a narrow channel through which air is able to uh, leave in a kind of turbulent way, right? So when I say shh, these are all fricative sounds, okay? Um, and then an approximate is that the things get close, but they don't get close enough to mess up the airflow. So it sounds like, so uh, for example, the, the Y in the word you is an approximate, you. I'm not fully constricting the airflow. I'm just kind of getting close. Uh, cool, great. So we're gonna walk through these each one by one and then um, practice them in our, in our groups. So the first one, we're going to uh, try to get our hands around or get our mouth around is the voiceless velar fricative. If you're using IPA, you're gonna be using this, just the letter X to represent it. And this will show up um, in Brazilian Portuguese for certain R sounds, um, and it will sew up in German, right? Uh, mostly for the CH sounds. Uh, so for those of you learning French, this does not show up in French. It does exist in Spanish and many other languages. However, for you French speakers, it's good to learn this one because it'll help us get to um, the French ones. So voiceless velar fricative, this sound occurs when we take the back of our tongue, which we just you know spent time meditating on, um, up to the soft palate. So when I say, for example, the, the we did the G sound earlier. Everyone say, um, let me just mute everybody again real quick before such a weird sounds. Um, all right, great. 
Everybody make the g, 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 g sound. All right, once again, notice how it's the back of your tongue. G, 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 g. You can see on my screen as well what's going on. G, 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 g. All right, now that's a voiced sound. I'm gonna turn off my voice and I'll get this, k, 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 which is a K. All right, so try that. K, 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 k. All right, great. Now, that K sound is created by placing the back of the tongue against the soft palate, building up air behind it, and then releasing it in a burst. Instead of re fully releasing the tongue, what I'm gonna do is keep it pressed there and then force air through a channel. So it's like this. All right, so place your tongue in the K position. Instead of releasing it, force air through. All right, that is our voiceless velar fricative. Um, so I'm gonna go, just, what I'm gonna do for these is when I introduce a sound, um, I'll bring somebody up who might be struggling with the sound and we'll see if we can troubleshoot it for her. So is anyone here not confident in their capacity to make that sound? And if so, unmute yourself and announce. Anybody? Anybody got it? Is anybody good on it? This this uh, K sound yeah. is further back on the palate. From the the G sound is like more forward, and the K is further back, right? Uh, so they're at the same place, and what and that's good. You'll it'll feel like when you first do this, these sounds would be in different places, but that's just the trick of the voicing gives it a slightly different feeling. So the k and the g k g are the exact same placing, um, as is the. K. So here, we'll try to do, Robert. Uh, let me hear your. Uh, I know some of these sounds like the microphones don't pick up. So try try again. All right, yeah, that sounds good. That's pretty good. Cool. Uh, anybody else? Is anyone else want to work that sound? That's the easiest one, so we can move on if you want. But anyone else struggle with that? Cool. All right, great. So what we're going to do, we're going to break out into our groups and um, uh, just quickly practice it. And what we're going to do is um, we have these vowel sounds, a, e, u, a, o, um, a, e, u, a, o, just the five vowels. And we're going to be doing uh, two different situations in a syllable. Either it comes before the vowel, which is ha, he, hu, he, ho, or it comes after a vowel. Ach, ich, uch, ich, och. All right. So anybody try that again, repeat after me. Ha, he, hu, he, ho, ach, Ich, uch, ich, och. All right, great. Uh, so I'm going to break you guys out into small rooms, and you're just going to practice that, and then just see if you can do each one. And if, if, if your partner sees that, like, ah, that sounds a bit off, just try to workshop it a little bit, and we can come back and see what, um, see what happened. All right. Okay, great. Any difficulties there? Once again, this is the easiest of the sounds. Uh, Emily, you're making a couple of faces there. Did you want to <laughs> say something? Uh, no, I'm just, I'm not 100% sure I have the sound mm -hmm. um, because I don't know. It's sounding to me like I, I speak a, a little bit of Spanish. It, it's sounding to me like I'm maybe more, mine's quite throaty. Is that right? It's like, or even like a Spanish J, I was thinking. So this is the Spanish J. This is oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. So you want to just make the sound so we can hear it. Um, uh, with a vowel sound. Yeah. Do or? the do the vowels just practice. Yeah. Um. I'm. Please correct me. It might not be correct. No. Ah. Ech. Ich. Och. Uch. Yep. It's good. Great. Good work. Uh. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else have any doubts? Questions? 
Yeah, I have a question, Idalsa. I'm afraid that it is vibrating too much. I'm going k k k, and then finding that position and going k k. But you feel it feels like it's vibrating, like a like yeah. when your tongue trills. Yeah, is it okay. Yeah, so we'll get to that. Uh, Emily had the same concern, and I'm okay. sure a lot of you guys had that same concern. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, reveal why that is to you in a moment. It'll help us transition to the next sound. Um, anyone else? Anyone else have a separate doubt or concern or practice? Kate? I noticed that when I um, make the sound, I feel like I just, like you were talking about deflating like a balloon, like all of my air just yeah. disappears. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wait, can, I, can, I, can I hear it? Ah, oh. Yeah. Ha. Yeah, it's good. So um, you know that Pentagon I had earlier, the efficiency one, and we, we first focus on actually getting the sound, getting it accurate and getting it consistent. Um, and then efficiency comes later. And we'll talk about that at the end, drills to practice your efficiency. Um, but actually, before I forget, I'm going to say it right now. The way you would practice any um, situation like that is called a sustenato drill is a musical term for sustaining the thing. Um, so what you would do is, we can all try this right now. Um, let's mute everybody again. We, we, you take a deep breath through your nose and then see if you can just hold it for as long as you can. Great. And um, so you wanna be able to hold as long as you can and you can set a timer for yourself and just keep getting a new personal record each time. In doing that and pushing yourself for the personal record, you'll start to figure out what micro adjustments you need to make to increase your efficiency and your breath economy. In general, um, it's a combination of learning how to not um, expel so hard with your breath, but also putting enough pressure on your tongue to get that kind of sweet spot. So it's like a coming out. So you just gotta figure that out on your own, but that's very normal, that's, that's to be expected. Great. Uh, cool. Anything else before we move on to the next sound? All right, great. So I want to touch on what Emily and Karen were referring to. Um, so Emily used the word uh, throaty, and then Karen used the word vibrating. Um, and what they're referring to, they're referring to the same phenomenon, which is basically this thing, the uvula, um, the uvula, which is the thing dangling at the back of your throat, you can see in mine. Uh, all the way at the back, the way your mouth is set up is you have your hard palate. That's the hard part. You can kind of use your tongue and the, the part that gets burnt with pizza and coffee as your hard palate. If it keeps going back, it changes into a, um, the bone goes away and it's a soft tissue. It's kind of like this kind of soft tissue. And then dangling at the end of that soft tissue is this uvula, right? And what happens is the higher up on the soft palate, you, if you're in a high velar fricative, you won't get much of that. If I bring it down more and just listen, I'm going to track my, you guys can see my mouse, right? All right, good. I'm going to, I'm going to try to track my mouse with where I'm putting my tongue. See if you can hear the, the transition, All right? What else we do here? Could you guys hear that? Yeah, so that's what we're gonna do next. That's our next drill. So thank you, thank you, uh, Emily and Karen for, for asking that question. Um, so we're gonna start from uh, as front as we can. And just so you know the border, there's a called a palatal fricative. Those of you learning German, this is the um, the CH sound in words like uh, ich, right? And zisch, right? That's actually used using this part of your tongue um, up here, right? So we're not going that far. We're using some of this part of our tongue. Take this part of the tongue and see how high and in, in front in your mouth you can get it going. It'll be a higher pitch sound. Right? Um, and then I want you to kind of map out 
this area, just kind of put your tongue go up and down in this area. It'll sound like you're at the dentist and they put that like sucky thing in your mouth, right? Keep doing that. What we're doing here is we're developing that fine motor coordination as well as that fine motor sensory awareness. So once again, while you do that, see if you can notice the muscle feeling, notice the sensations on your tongue and your throat, on your roof of your mouth. All right, good. That's another good drill to be doing as a way to get much more two things, fine motor, coordination in your back of your tongue, as well as a more finely tuned perception, right? I bet few of you, if any of you really noticed that there's a difference in those two sounds until I pointed it to you, right? And now you can hear one's higher pitch and one's lower pitch, right? Now, if you're able to get that, I want you to map in your mind, the feeling of going from a high pitch down to a lower pitch, That is the feeling of the back of your tongue moving down, okay? So if we continue with that feeling and go even more down and back, see if you can get to where things get throatier or vibrating, right? Here you might, uh, to, um, we said earlier, you might lose your air economy, that's fine. Just kind of reset, but see if you can start here and slowly walk your way down to the uvula. All right, let's see um, how you guys are doing with that. Uh, who is confused, lost, doesn't know what's going on? Uh, Robert, and then Denny, Denise. Uh, yeah, my question is, are uh... When we're doing this, do we move the tongue forward and backward to do that? Or is it like a more like a rocking motion? Yeah, rocking is more accurate. So you saw where there's two planes we're moving. There's two planes we're moving on, right? So this is, if this thing here is my uvula and this is the palate, this, then my tongue is going. So it's going back and down and you know the whole shape of the tongue will be shifting as well right uh idausa i'm finding that i am getting that sound better however i'm aware that my tongue is also wide and i feel like the edges of my tongue might be vibrating like there's something happening at the edge of my tongue and then something happening in the part where my tongue rounds up like the thickness mm -hmm. and Anyway, I just I just don't know what to do with that, but I I'm aware of it and I'm getting the sound better because I was doing and now I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me get a good photo of the uvula here. Please. You know, so once again, we're looking at a um, we're looking at a three dimension. We're looking at a two dimensional image when we're looking at this thing, but we're not two dimensional creatures. You know, we're three dimensions. Our tongue is three dimensions. So right. um, with a non diseased one here uh cool and um so you can see this this our this whole space here is going to be coming into contact um uh, but then once again the thing that's actually vibrating here is just this so when you that vibrating feeling is only this your tongue's not doing any vibrating your tongue is just a it's just a foundation for the other thing to vibrate on top of all right um so yeah keep playing with that uh denise you had a question oh uh, you're on mute yeah, I just don't think I'm doing it right. Um, cool. so let's, 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 let's coach you through it. And then everyone else, you're on mute and just, you can follow along with the coaching. Uh, so let's see what you got. It's like, yeah. I don't know, it's sort of like, it goes from here to there without that smooth uh, trend. Oh, that's fine. As long as you're, are you, I mean, I'm able to hear a uh, distinction between the end and the beginning, right? Like a higher pitch and then like a, a vibrating one. 
that's all that matters. Um, I can do it very controlled because I've done it a million times. Um, so you just got to, you, you start off and then you get a higher resolution as you do it. And it doesn't matter if you can do like the one in between because um, you, you, as long as you can do two different sounds, um, that's what you're going after. So you, that's, that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Did anyone feel like they weren't able to get that sound? I was able to get it, but it felt like it was making my throat sore. And I don't know if that means that I'm just overdoing it or like, I felt myself almost going so far back that I would begin to gag a little bit. And I'm wondering when in sort of that more intense version, are you supposed to go that far or like, how do you sort of navigate, navigate that? Yeah. So it's, it's basically the same as, as what you're asking me for about the economy thing. Right. So you first find it. Uh, and then especially for this R1, because there's, um, you know, there's more space you're gonna have lots of air flying out of it. Um, and then, yeah, you might be going too far back, a little bit up, but you're gonna be trying to find that sweet spot over time. So we can hear yours right now. So see if you can do that drill. Uh, yeah, that's good. And keep in mind too, that when you're speaking French, you're not gonna be like, you're not gonna like, you're not gonna stay on it for 10 seconds. So you're only gonna do it for like a very short period of time. Um, it's not, it's not designed for you to have breath for a long time with it, but that sounds good. You, you're doing it good. Okay. Uh, Danny. It, it, also, it always reminds me of kind of like the CH sound when, when we say a word like Hanukkah. Yeah. And the Hebrew is also the, um, it also shows up in Hebrew. It's the same sound that we're, yeah. we're going going. Hebrew as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So once again, I, I just put the main languages that we're doing here, but this is a very common sound. It shows up in countless languages. As long as I know I'm on the right track. Yeah. And to the point I said earlier about languages, about movement, you know, what I try to teach people is to move away from words and letters and spellings and to really ground your understanding of language in your body. It's an embodied feeling. So then what happens is just like Danny had, you now have this sound and notice we didn't mention any French words or German words yet. We're just, we're just doing a movement, you know, and then you, you know, you go to a Hanukkah celebration and someone's like, you know, and you're like, like, oh, that's the same movement I made earlier on that Zoom call, right? And you don't need someone to spell it for you or anything, right? And if you're going to a foreign country you've never even heard of before and you're trying to mimic, you can be like, oh, wait, I know that sound, I know that sound, I know that sound, and I can mimic it, right? That's the goal. Uh, cool, let's move, let's move along then so we can get the rest of these sounds here. Uh, cool, so that is our voiceless um, uvular fricative. Now things get a bit trickier. Uh, actually, before we, before we do that, we're gonna break up breakout rooms again. And same deal as last time. It only counts if I can put it, you know, with things. So, okay, great. So now let's practice it. Everybody after me. Ha. Chi. Chu. Che. Cho. Ach. Ich. Uch, ech, och. Right, I'm gonna bring you out into your groups. Um, some of these may be more difficult for you than others. The reason for that is because each vowel is a different tongue position. So you have to kind of adjust the whole tongue structure slightly to get the sound you want for the R. Um, one quick tip. Um, what will happen for a lot of you guys is you'll have a motor pattern that will bring your tongue to maybe say R or like R or something like that. Um, if you're doing anything else, break it down into two. So if you can do ah, uh, and you can do uh, technically you can do ah. Uh, so you just have to practice the transition. And the way you practice that is you say ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, right? And just gradually close that gap until it blends together, right? And then have your buddy, keep track on you and tell each other, do you think it sounds clean or not? Yeah, there. Uh, cool, yeah. Um, you know, so let's just hear, I know we had our, or we had our one-on-one -on -one too. Let's just hear yours real quick. Just um, do uh, ha, chi, hu. Ha, chi, hu. Perfect. Ho. Rejoin, rejoin. I can't say that word. On the other side, ach, ich, uch. 
Ach, ich, auch. Ach, auch. Oh. All right, great. Ach, oh. Cool. Good job, guys. So, so far, we're moving along pretty well. Now things get a bit trickier. This is where usually where people start to trip up a little bit. So we're going to do a couple of drills to get us confident on this last next sound. So we just did the um, voiced less uvular fricative. And what we're going to do now is the voiced uvular fricative. So as far as our tongue is concerned, it's doing the exact same thing, going to the exact same place, airflow the exact same way. The only difference is that now our vocal cords are vibrating. And a lot of people find it difficult to create this sound while simultaneously vibrating the vocal cords. Um, so there's a couple of ways we can attack it. Um, the first one, I'm going to just uh, mute everybody again. Okay, the first one is to um, come at it from the G sound, okay? So we had our valor here. If we had a k k k as our K, we also have our g g g as our G. So everybody say g g g, right? And then just like before, we're gonna try to like, kind of like a frog hop our way down and back with this g. So we'll go. All right, you get that weird sound at the end. That's your tongue coming into uvula contact. Do one more time. Okay, um, so that's a tricky sound for a lot of people. Who who's struggling with that sound? Uh, Nick, make sure you try, and then Robert. Uh, you're on mute, Nick. Oh, uh, Nick, do you, do you still want to do it? Can you hear me? So, yeah, yeah. Just came up mute or unmute uh, on my screen again. Yeah, I can hear you now. So, yeah, let's we'll see here. Good, 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 good. Can you get that good, good sound? Good, 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 good. Right. So, start, start with the normal G. Good, good, good. Good, 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 good. Go. And then, uh, right. Yeah. That's good, actually. So you don't want to leave it there and have a when that comes later. Just say good, 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 right. All right, good. Yeah. So you're so you're, you're going to the fricative, which is fine because we're going towards. So you should be good for now. I'll just move on to to Robert. You want to try? Uh, yeah, actually, you're doing the approximate. That is the uh, you're doing the sound that we're uh, we're looking for, and uh, that was actually Robert Muir. I think Robert Bryan, you had your hand up too. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you were you weren't um, able to you were keep your tongue at that valor point. Um, can you can I hear your your normal yeah. voice? Uh -huh. Ra, ro, ri, ro, ro. All right, great. So you can bring your tongue to that position. Um, once again, start from the G. That's good. So that's good. So I started you guys with the more the more challenging one, which is to get to this um to get to this uh which is difficult. Uh, but really, just so I can you can practice moving your tongue down while keeping your voice on. Um, now that we've uh, now that we've tried that out a little bit, um, we're gonna do it again, but this time, instead of doing this kind of frog jumping um, G sound, we're going to try to get, this sound here is called a valor, a voiced valor fricative. Um, guh, guh, guh. In that same G position, we're gonna hold our tongue there and let air pass through, so it's guh, guh, guh. Uh, 
see if you can get that sound. And once again, spot check it with your G. Kind of like you're saying G very slowly. That's the veil of fricative. All right, we will let me hear a couple of people's. I'm gonna call on some people and see who we haven't heard from yet. Um, how about um, uh, Neri? No. Yeah. You wanna give it a try? Uh, you got a good one. Um, who else? Jason, you wanna try it? Uh, yeah, so, um, so you're going you're going you're going down a little bit. So start with the G first. G g g g g g. Then g g g g g g g. Nice, cool. And then so that's good. So why are we doing this drill right here? What our goal is here is to be able to keep our um, keep our voice activated while we have the back of our tongue up in a fricative position. Uh, now we're going to do what we did earlier. Same thing as we had before. It was the uh, uh, same path. But now we're doing it with a uh, and slowly moving our tongue down uh, uh, until it gets throaty and vibrating. Uh, uh, now, what will happen for a lot of you is once you get here, your voice is gonna to start to flicker off like, like a light, right? You're gonna say, and then go back to the voiceless. The name of the game here is to see if you can keep your voice. You can put your hand on your throat. And so when you voice, you feel that whole vibration. And just to feel it, make this, then make the voiceless one. No vibration. So massive difference in your, in your hand feeling. So try to keep it going continuously as you move your tongue down. All right, keep trying that for a bit. I'll demo one more time. So, sorry, what, are we doing it voiced or unvoiced right now? Keeping the voice the whole time. So you start voiced, Okay. You start with you start with the G, a uh, voiceless veil, voiced velar fricative. And the goal is to keep it voiced. As you move down, you might want to twitch, switch off your voice. Try to stop that from happening. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Keep playing that for a little bit. <laughs> And explore that space, that transition space between your velum and your uvula. Um, if you can hear it, this is pure velum. Uh, this is like the transition space, the very top of the uvula. Uh, now, is there... Sorry, you got a... Uh, say that again, Karen? Uh, you're still on mute. Myself. There it is. Hey, go ahead. Uh, uh, I still feel some vibration. <laughs> You're going to want to feel vibration. Okay. I can feel it here. Yeah, that's good. And I'm, so I'm making this a sound. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. That's, that's good. Um, okay, good. Thanks. And just so you guys know as well, just to, I didn't map this sound on here, but um, you know, when you're making this French R sound, you're kind of right at the top of the uvula in general. And if you get at a sweet spot with the back of your tongue to the uvula, um, the uvula will kind of vibrate in a consistent way. That's technically a trill sound. Um, so a smooth trill sounds like this. So sometimes you'll get that kind of trill thing. That's fine. Um, you, uh, what we're typically looking for is just a normal kind of you know, dirty fricative. <sighs> All right, cool. So it looks like a lot of you guys are getting that. Um, does anyone want help with that 
voiced one before you combine it with vowels. Dun, dun, dun. All right, uh, in that case, I'm gonna break you out into rooms again and same routine. We're just now going to, this might be a bit trickier once again to combine it with um, vowels. So everyone repeat after me on mute. Um, la, li, lu, le, lo, al, il, ul. All right, so break out to your rooms, try it. And once again, if you're, these are different tongue positions. So if you start to do a weird thing, like make an English R, like ah, right, point to your partner to cut that out and split it into two. Ah, 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 ah. All right. If you can do two sounds individually and you can't do them together, that just means you have a transition problem. And that's very easy to solve if you take the time to solve it properly by separating it and slowly reducing the gap. All right. Uh, great. So I'll break you out into rooms for two minutes. Or Eli, maybe. Mm. <laughs> Nice. Let's try the vowels. Ra, re. Ra, re, ri, ro, ru. Nice. Uh, and then the other side. Ar, il, ur. Uh, should we do them? Yeah, do a, do a vowel first. Ar, il, ur. Ar, ar, er, ir, or, ur. Nice. Cool. Good work, guys. Any other questions on that? Before you move on to the final R sound. All right, great. So next one is going to be the hardest one for a lot of people. Um, and this is the uvular approximate. So for the two we just did, I feel the three we just did, in each of these cases, the back of the tongue came and physically made contact with the first the soft palate and then the uvula for these other ones. For this approximate sound, it's approximating the uvula, but not actually touching it. It's kind of stopping halfway. So it's kind of, once again, a very fine motor. Someone asked before about not being able to do like a, a slow controlled walk down, uh, which is normal. You start off kind of broad strokes and then it gets higher resolution as you keep practicing. So for this one, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start with a neutral tongue position uh, and then go, all the way back to that last sound we just did. So it's like this. Uh, all right, so practice that a few times. Now we're gonna do it very slow. Uh, so you know when I make contact, once you start hearing all those vibrating sounds. Uh, Okay, so do a couple of tries of that, trying to get there as slowly as possible without stopping. So it's a continuous movement, but as slow as you possibly can. Okay, and the next thing you'll do and by the way, I'm just kind of introducing these exercises to you. You'll, you'll want more time to fool around this on your own. Um, once you're able to move it back a bit slower with more control, now see if you can, while you're doing it, hear three distinct categories of sound. The neutral relaxed position, uh, and then halfway there, uh, as distinct from when I make contact. And then see if you can move through those three points. Uh, 
you know, basically our goal is to find this, find this spot in the middle. Ooh, I'm not making any contact or making any turbulent airflow. That is our approximate sound. And once you're able to do that, the next thing will be a bit trickier is see if you can move between just the neutral vowel in that position back and forth without touching the uvula at all. It's a very subtle sound, subtle movement. It's just a restriction. Okay, so if you're able to manage that sound, you'll have your voiced uvular approximant. Um, does anyone have any questions on that or want me to spot check it for you? Yes, please spot check it for me. Yeah. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, I thought it was alternate between um, the vowel uh, 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 uh
Um, so you want to have all this, the vowel sounds and make sure you can do each combo on either the front or the back. Um, and then not just combining with vowel sounds, but also in combination with consonant sounds. Okay. Um, so for this, this final piece here, we'll quickly review this. We already are able to do the ha, chi, hu, he, ho, and the ra, ri, ru, re, ro. All we're doing is putting a consonant in front of that. But because everything, when we pronounce things kind of co-articulated at the same time, we have to kind of find how to subtly place our tongue to prevent, uh, to prepare ourselves for the, for the pronunciation. So whenever you have a, this is for French and German, whenever you have a voiceless consonant in front of an R, it's going to be the voiceless uvular fricative because of the efficiency. So these are p, f, t, k. These are voiceless consonants. So when I combine it with a k, it's p, f, t, k, right? Pcha, 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 kha, pri, pri, tri, kri, right? So this is the combo. So how do you practice the combo if you're struggling with it? Once again, you have to first make sure you can do the sound on its own. Now let's visualize what's happening in our mouth, starting with the P. Our tongue is gonna to be here for the uvula. Meanwhile, our lips are coming together for the P. So air comes behind the lips. And then as soon as we release the lips, our back of our tongue is going to the thing. So you wanna practice this. So you're basically, same as you're saying like a pa, pa, but instead of releasing into a vowel, you're releasing into the So practice that a few times. All right, cool. That one's the easier one. Next one is the F. The F is being made with the lip to the teeth. And it's a continuous airflow all the way through. All right, cool. And then quickly moving on. Um, the uh, these ones are a bit trickier. So the T. Because now the P and the F, we're just using our lips. So, you know, our tongue is not really involved. But for, for these, you're using our tongue, um, which means the front of our tongue is doing one thing. Basically, we're printing the, the point number two, the blade of our tongue against the alveolar ridge. And then the back of our tongue is doing something else. So it's a bit of a, of a maneuver, right? <sighs> So you have to figure out how to place your tongue for the T before you release it so that you're ready to go right into the uvular fricative. All right, and then the final one, this is the hardest one, is actually using the same part of the tongue, right? So we start with our K, and then that, that the tongue is releasing back to the uvula as we practiced earlier. And if you actually look in my mouth, you can see it happening. It's that downward movement of my tongue is the point number five moving from the K position and releasing into the uvula. All right, that is our voice less. I'm gonna um, be on for another 10 minutes. So feel free to leave if your time is up, but I wanna quickly go over the, the next one, which is harder. Same thing, 
The B is just the voiced version of the P, V of the F, et cetera, et cetera. These are the voice versions. So we're doing the exact same physical movements here, but now we're using our voice at the same time, which makes it that much more complicated. So if you can, you have to first make sure you can already do the voiced la, li, lu, le, lo, So when I can do that sound, now I'm gonna practice releasing from the B. That's my lips again. Then for the V. Then for the D, placing my tongue properly ahead of time, so I'm ready for it. And then finally, the G, the hardest one, using the back of my tongue. All right, cool. So I know that's a lot to take in in a short period of time, uh, but I want you to have the basic principle. You're, it's a movement practice. This is a movement practice. So it's the same way you go to a dance class and you see the move and you, you can't quite get it, but you can at least see what's going on and how you can improve it. That's the goal here. Um, so let's uh, go see questions or what, were, were anybody able to get that? Linda, you got a question? Yes, I generally have trouble hearing whether R is voiced or not when it's in the middle of a word. And uh, other than what you just said about the voice and voices consonants, let's say if R comes after a vowel, but it's in the middle of a word, it seems that it's usually voiced, but I'm just completely unsure. Like, uh... Yeah, so a couple of answers to that question. Um, first, um, I don't recommend um, having any kind of rules in the head for any particular language, like, oh, when it's here, it's gonna be this. Um, those things will intuitively start to appear to you. Um, second, your, your, your goal is to be able to match, right? So if you hear, is it a or is it a right? So you're listening, you're trying to hear that difference. Um, you can practice with ear and listening to audio, slowing it down and listening intently and making a conscious decision. Like, oh, I'm pretty sure he's doing the uh, But actually most listening is done with your mouth, right? So when you practice these drills and you distinguish, you know, between, um, you know, one drill we didn't do is to distinguish between a voice less and a voice, I can, I can just, alternate between the two like this. So that increased physical mastery will translate into your hearing because what happens when you're actually hearing somebody is you're kind of in your mind um, imitating it, right? Our bodies are kind of mirror neuron mapping it at the same time. But if you, if you don't have that distinction embodied within you, then you won't be able to perceive that distinction. Um, as well in others. So counterintuitively, the best way to train your ear is to train your um, pronunciation. Um, and then, oh, and one final point on that. For the most part, um, when you're speaking, or like in French, for example, whether they do one or the other is not gonna affect the meaning, right? There's, it's, there's no words that like, if you do the voiceless version, it's a completely different word or something like that, it doesn't happen. Um, um, all this is mostly a question of your own flow and your accent while you're speaking and listening to people. Um, so I do want you to, to focus on and try to get it perfect, um, but keep in mind that, um, you know, oh, and one more point too, which is that there won't, because they're allophonic, which is to say that those two sounds in French, for example, um, can interchange and people won't notice, they will interchange even within the same speaker. 
So you might be like, oh yeah, this word's always the huh. And then you hear it's a different thing in a, you know, like a five minutes later. And so don't let that confuse you. It's just, you know, it's just how people talk. Uh, cool. Any other questions? Uh, could you give us some examples, like using these different R's in some words in German or French? Or? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that now. So I got a little chart here, and I'll give more words than I have. Uh, cool. So let's review these. Um, let's review these sounds and where they show up. Um, so in French, no velar fricative chach sound going on at all, um, and you don't really hear of ch at the beginning of a vowel either. Um, at the end, just like I was saying to Linda, you, I can say for, or I can say for, or I can say for, right? This is all depending on, you know, what's going on in the rest of the sentence. Um, and then in the beginning of a vowel, of a syllable, I'm typically doing the voice. Rouge, 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 rouge. rouge. Uh, rouler, uh, rentrer, right? Um, and then um, we have, uh, let me make sure I got everyone muted again. Uh, great. And then moving on in German, it's not our sound technically, but just because it's here, the CH in this place will often be a machen, but it might also be a, um, a um, machen, right? And uh, but then also in the beginning of words, reisen, riesen, ole, right? Uh, but all the other sounds don't exist. What you get in German is um, the uh, uh, just like a, a, a vowel sound. Like, you yeah, the letter R will be pronounced like, you know, tua, fua, shua. So we don't, we don't cover that here. Uh, great. Then Brazilian Portuguese and is quite uh, unique. Well, not unique, but it's um, with the R sound, Different parts of Brazil will pronounce the R's differently depending on the word and situation. Um, this is looking at like the Rio one and um, pretty much all parts of Brazil. When R is the beginning of something, it'll be the velar fricative. Hua, hua, hada, um, happy, um, Ricardo, right? Um, but then also at the end of a vowel, Oh, favor, ach, ich, oh, you, right? That's the sound. Compare that to Portuguese, where you never have the velar fricative, is always a voiceless. So they don't say hew, they'll say hew. They don't say hua, they say hua, right? So those two. And then the rest of their R's are going to be this, this, the ones for tomorrow's lecture. Uh, with the tip of the tongue, All right? Um, cool, I actually recommend to, um, I'll send these slides and recording out. I recommend to, you make your own spreadsheet or your own, you know, handwritten thing of these categories, as well as these categories. I'll give you some words here too, for like um, French, this is gonna be French and German. Um, Pratiquer, uh, Proust, uh, promet, Promesse, um, Prince, Principal, Fraternité, frère, frite, um, travail, trombe, can you else with tra? Incroyable, cré, crise. Um, and then for German, um, prout. It's, it's, it's switching between them, like it's, it's really confusing. Cras, <laughs> um, uh, I'm blanking. Trotzdem, trotzdem. Um, but actually, while I was finishing my last thought, if you get a like, spreadsheet or a piece of paper and then put each of these columns, you know, I give you do a per vowel to you know, P X I P F P X I X U, all the vowels and like whatever. And then just start putting words that you know underneath. This will do a couple of things for you. One, it will um, help organize these sounds and, and movements quicker and more deeply in your, in your body and in your mind. Um, when you see it show up in all the different words that you know in your vocabulary. Um, secondly, it'll also more deeply ingrain and organize your vocabulary in your head 
the way, um, which goes into your spoken fluency. So the way speaking actually works. Like right now, I'm not thinking about the next word I'm going to say. It's just flowing out of me. And the way that that kind of works and the long short of it is um, the word I'm saying now is connected to saying, right? Saying now is connected to all these other words in my semantic web in my head, right? So if I have as many connections as possible in between words, so not just connecting words by their meaning, but also connecting them by their, uh, by their sound. You know, another thing is rhyming, if I get words that rhyme together, but basically just any kind of phonetic connection between things will increase the total density of your network of connections in your mind. And the more dense that network is, then the quicker your mind can find the word is looking for. It's kind of like if you have a bunch of words like a house and you have a bunch of houses scattered about like a, you know, a field, and then you just make a pathway between as many houses as you possibly can. You know, the more pathways you get, the faster you can get from one word, one house to the next, you know? So that's, that's um, this, this kind of stuff actually helps your vocabulary as well. Um, so yeah, that is all I wanted to cover today. Actually, I had one last thing here, which is when you're practicing these things, Right now we're just trying to try to get the movement and feel it out, right? So we can get our accuracy and, and then see if we can get it. For training the other things, I highly encourage you to use um, a uh, metronome, especially for building up your speed. And what you do is quite simple. You just put on the beat and let's just say you're practicing, you have a list of things here and I'm just like, ha, he, Right. Um, and then I'm like, okay, cool. Let's push myself. See how fast I can do it. Right. Um, or just jumping around going down. That's doesn't mind. That's that's too difficult for me. <laughs> right. So uh, but yeah, like what you're doing is you want to start at like a speed that's you know at your limit, get comfortable with it, and then increase it like another couple of BPM, and then get comfortable with it and then increase it. And you'll be shocked at how quickly you can solve speed issues that people will spend years getting stuck on a sound. And then we'll do a training and I'm like, okay, cool. Do this with a metronome and come back to me next week. And boom, they've solved like a three-year problem in a couple of days. So don't underestimate the power of a metronome. And once again, what you're looking at here, first question, am I able to get the sound, distinguish it from all the others? Um, am I able to do it in all the variety? We don't capture all the variety here. You wanna get all the vowel sounds for your language, um, but this captures all the consonant combos you'll possibly do. Um, and then, um, once you know, you can do it accurately in all the situations, put on a metronome and try to do it. And maybe you're like, ha, 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 right. And like every three, you're kind of like messing it up or running out of air. Just keep doing it and see if I can do like 60 seconds with no mistakes, you know, it just keeps gradually building up and boom, now you're getting all the sounds accurate in all the different contexts on a consistent basis. Now let's work on your speed and efficiency. Um, they play hand in hand. When you make it faster and faster and faster, it forces you to figure out how to be more efficient with your airflow. Um, and then you'll figure out how to do it more subtly, how to do it more nuanced. And um, yeah, and once again, like I said earlier, all this energy put into this is not for nothing. It all bubbles upstream into you speaking much more fluidly and having much more confidence and ultimately connecting with people more in the language, right? Uh, great, so that's all I got for today. What, what, what end up now some questions. And yes, I'm gonna send out a recording and, um, and slides later today. Any following, any final thoughts, questions? Yeah, I have a quick question um, yeah. on the third R. Uh, the last I'm talking about, I, I'm learning French. So there's like three that we're talking about, right? On the one that's yeah. in between, 
I was previously taught, I want your opinion on this, concentrate on the first two and the third comes with, with speed, right? That's what everybody like, when, so when I've been practicing, it's been the first two. And then I was told like, really don't worry about the third. It's, it, 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 it just comes as you become more fluent. Is that right or wrong? Uh, in terms of the use of my time, right? Yeah, yes and no, I mean, it, it definitely comes. I mean, um, I think, why don't people say that is because they don't know how to practice the other one. Okay. So, so I mean, if you can practice it specifically, then yep. why not? It will accelerate the process. But okay. what happens is that third one, the, uh, the approximate, you know, in the language, it, it exists because people are speaking fast. So it naturally yep. happens. So if you're naturally speaking, getting faster and faster with your, uh, then it will start to naturally fall into place in your speech. Um, but if you practice it directly, you'll get there even faster. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good question. Thank, question. thank you, Ado. So that is very interesting. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. All right, cool, guys. Well, I'm going to be doing it again tomorrow. This time we're doing the, and the da, 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 tip of the tongue sounds. So those of you learning Spanish or Portuguese uh, or learning French in like West Africa or like you know, some old school Quebec or something like that. Um, and Germans, I think, in like, in like Switzerland. You know, all these sounds get mixed up even within a language in different accents. So it is, it is actually good to just know all of them. And then that way you won't be um, at risk of getting confused when you travel someplace. Uh, cool. So 2 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. We're back at it. Thank you for joining. I'll send a recording out later today when it's uploaded. And uh, thank you. Catch you next. All right. Thank, thank you. Guys. you. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir.